good news, huh? Vipers, burning. If this is the good news John has, I'm not sure I want to hear the bad news. For John comes preaching, as many of us have grown up who are my age and older in the style of the fire and the brimstone prophet, announcing judgment, calling for repentance, but proclaiming that the Messiah is coming. And all in all, it really is a sober message. It starts with, you snakes. And it ends with, and if you're not careful, you're going to burn and burn up completely. Then Luke, writing, closes with those words. John proclaimed good news to the people. How in the world... Is a group of snakes burning up in an unquenchable fire. How is that good news? Let's go back and look and see how Luke puts the words and the scene together with John. It begins with the people who have gathered. John, Luke simply describes the audience as the crowds. We hear that and think a lot of people, but for Luke it was different. The crowds in the writings of Luke mean misfits, outcasts, the folks who nobody else wanted. As is often the case in his gospel, Luke turns his attention to those who are outside the acceptable realms. Those who are outside of society, those who are on the margins. And this day, Luke has John honor them by paying attention to them. By listening to them, even if it's words of judgment, they are beginning to understand that they matter. And so they hear these words of judgment. You snakes, be careful. You might just burn up. But they hear them. And the crowds and the tax collectors and the soldiers all ask the same question. What should we do? And John doesn't hold back and he tells them. But notice that his instructions don't fit his judgment words. You would think a fire and brimstone preacher would come down hard on him. One day when I was at Carson Newman, excuse me, I was at Jefferson City working with some students from Carson Newman. And we had gone just down here into the edge of East Knoxville. There's a housing development down there. And we were working for the day. It's a very dangerous place. Um, A lot of crime, but there was a good ministry going on there. And we were there to help uh, repair the center, uh, the Baptist center that was in the middle of this housing development. And so we were moving along, working along there several hours. And then all of a sudden, one just I, I was in the back part of the house, and I heard this screaming and shouting. And all of a sudden, I went, oh, no, we've got an incident happening right out in front. And so I kind of moved to the window real quickly, expecting to see some kind of conflict going on. Instead, it was a young man with a Bible about this big, huge Bible. And he was holding it open, and he was walking back and forth on the sidewalk out in front, giving his best John the Baptist imitation, I'm telling you. And I'm just telling you, if you don't straighten up today... You will burn in a fire. I mean, he was really letting it fly. And so I thought, oh, well, okay, he's out trying to do what he feels led to do. And I started to turn, and all of a sudden I saw this uh, black, young, young, old teenager, young adult, not quite sure, late teens, early 20s. He came walking around the corner like he was going somewhere, but this young man caught his attention. And, and, and the guy preaching had gone like this. The man was coming, and he had just turned when this guy came around the corner. So he was going this way. Well, this young man altered his course and actually moved, started moving right over to what was going on. And so I stopped. I thought, gosh, what's going to happen here? And this guy, and didn't realize this guy was really right behind him. But I'm thinking, Maybe this guy has a question. Maybe this guy really wants to know what he's saying. And so, and he turned around, you know, and kind of startled him for a millisecond. 
And then this guy with the Bible lit into him. Didn't know the guy, didn't even know what he wanted. Well, I'm telling you, if you don't. Well, this guy's eyes got this big. And he took off running just as fast as he could go. That's what you expect from a fire and brimstone preacher, right? To be coming down and even if you get the chance to not let up, but to really let them have it. Not John. Notice what John says to them. What should we do, the crowds ask. And John just says, hey, if you got two coats, give one to somebody that doesn't have one. If you got a little extra food, share that with somebody around you. Oh, okay. Tax collectors, when they came up and said, John, what should we do? Notice that he did not say, go and sell everything you have. Get rid of all of it, which is, tends to be something Jesus said every now and then to rich people. But that's not what he said, did he? He just said, just take only what is fair. To the soldiers, actually, they were mercenaries. They were hired thugs. That's really kind of what we're looking at here who went around and used their force to make people do whatever they felt like they wanted them to do. To them, he says, don't use your force. Do good to people. Reduced to everyday language, these are playground rules that John says when the people come up and say, what should we do? And he says, share, be fair, don't bully. What John offers them, you see, is good news because it's entirely within their reach. John does not ask them to leave their current stations. In fact, the assumption here is, is that the very next day, we're going to assume that the tax collectors were still collecting tax, the soldiers were still soldiering, but hopefully they were thinking about what they were doing differently now. They were thinking about it in the context of the coming kingdom, which is interesting, you see, Caught between judgment and the coming of the Messiah, the crowds hear John speak of a role in the coming kingdom that they can play. John doesn't demand of them some kind of monastic life where you denounce everything and run off. Nor does he say, oh, it's going to take you a long spiritual pilgrimage. John invites them to participate in God's coming kingdom wherever they are and whatever it is they are doing. All they need to begin to do is just see that what they are doing, God can use. This is the promise that we are all invited into, every one of us. Wherever you may be and whatever it is that you are doing, God wants to be a part of that with you. Do you work in a business? Then do it fairly. Do it fairly. And do it actually seeing how can I help the people who come to my business. Are you at home raising children? Raise them to love God by loving their neighbor. Even the difficult ones. Are you a teacher? Do so with patience and with hope. Are you a student? Learn everything you can about everything you can and then ask God how you can help what you've learned make the world a better place. There are ways for you to impact the world exactly where you are is what John is telling us. The Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper said this, there is not one square inch of this universe about which Christ cannot say, that is mine. Now when we think about that, certainly our minds move to sweeping images of big things, like powers and principalities, like nations and kings, like planets and star systems. Certainly there are none of that that God is not own and be a part of, but God also owns 
the not-so-big things like cooking spaghetti, like working on an Excel spreadsheet, like changing the oil in your car. You see, so often it's my observation, and as I listen, that many people think that what they do day in and day out at the factory, in the classroom, around the dinner table, does not matter much in the way of spiritual life. But you are wrong. According to the Gospel of Luke and the words of John. You see, when those people came to ask John what the coming change meant for them in their ordinary lives, John sent them back to their ordinary lives as changed people. He sends them back not necessarily to try and change the world on their own and do something different. No, John just told them to do what they had been doing all along, but now do it in a way that somehow colors inside the lines of what God is doing in the world. John tells them that though what they do may seem small or insignificant, just the contrary. It is a part of what God is doing in the world. Commitment to God does not have to be heroic. There are opportunities to do God's will, to be God's people all around us. The opportunities are shaped by our context, the roles in which we find ourselves, and the needs of the neighbors and the people around us. But make no mistake, those opportunities are everywhere. And so maybe this is the core of what John speaks when he says it's good news. Because it is good news to know that God cares enough about us to want to come and say, live your life differently. Live it in a right way. I knew as an athlete, one of the things that I hated is if we were in a drill and I had completely messed that drill up, completely just blew it right out the water, didn't get anything right. And what I learned to hate is if my coach stepped up to me and said, okay, next. (laughs) What that meant was, yeah, good, good, get out of my way. You're not even worth my time. What I learned to appreciate is when that coach got in my face and said, Elliot, what kind of, son, you're not even thinking. Look, come back over here and let's get this done right. Because then it told me I mattered to the coach. (coughs) Excuse me. And so God says today, hey, your life matters to me. Let's let's make sure you're getting your life right. But it's also good news to know that what God requires of me really may just be right where I live. The gospel will change the whole world, including the little corner of the world where you and I live and work and breathe every day. My dad um, told me this story about his own life when I was talking to my mom and dad uh, way back there in my life when I was processing what God wanted me to do with mine and I was beginning to to think maybe God was calling me into ministry. This was before I actually made that decision and my so I talked to my mom and dad a little bit later on that day my dad said son let me I want to share with you a story about my life. He said uh, he had gone to Tennessee Tech um, to be an engineer, and he'd, he basically was in his first two years. And it was his summer uh, between the first year and the second year. Um, Dad had been a follower of Christ and had, had been seeking to know what God wanted him to do with his life. And uh, so he had joined a, it actually was a summer missionary, student missionary uh, back then. He was in California, of all places. Never knew my dad had even gone to California. Strange what you learn about your parents from time to time. But dad said, I was in California and I was doing some construction work and, and, and just praying constantly, God, what is it you want me to do with my life? And he said, I went to California really thinking that, believing that God really wanted me to go into full-time ministry, wanted me to be a minister. 
He said, but I got out there, and I began to work, and I began to work on that house, and I began to encounter folks, and he said, it was as clear as if God were standing literally right in front of me physically and, and speaking to me. He said, I heard his voice as I was hammering on a house out there. He said, Ray, that was my dad's name, Ray, I want you to be an engineer. I want you to be a good engineer, and I want you to be an, a great layman. That's, we may not use that term enough, but we talk about ministers and laypersons, people who are part of a church. This is not how you make your living, but that's called a layperson, layman. He said, and I want you to be a great lay minister in whatever church you find yourself in. Dad said it was just as clear as a bell. And said from that day on, he knew exactly what he needed to do. Came back, finished that year, ran out of money. So got in the Air Force for four years, was in Europe. I came along, he married my mom. Well, he married my mom first. Then, then I came along. <laughs> uh, let's get that clear. And, and, uh, and then came back and he finished his two years, got a degree in engineering. My dad was a great engineer. But he was a incredible, outstanding layman in every church that he served. And that's the good news today. That's the good news that John is speaking about here. Yes, your life matters to God. It matters deeply. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come here, but with an eye of knowing where he was headed. But then God also says, but you too have a role to play. And you don't have to become some missionary, some Mother Teresa, some Billy Graham. That was their job. I called into that. I call you to do what you're doing right now. But you do it understanding that I am working through you. So when you speak a word to that student that you're teaching, when you embrace ethical business practices in your office and other people, maybe younger adults, who aren't quite sure that what they can get away with, but they begin to understand this is about authenticity and integrity. When you teach your children to love the neighbor, whoever the neighbor is, God says that's what I need you to do. It's a promise we are all invited into. It is entirely within our reach. Share, be fair, don't bully. It may not be heroic, but it is something that all of us can do. And God says, I need you to do that today, where you are. Thanks be to God. Lord, thank you for your word to us. And today we ask for forgiveness when sometimes we hear that word and we still try to make it something huge and extraordinary and to say, well, you know, I can't uh, be a missionary. I can't be a preacher. Uh, so, I, God, I guess you're not really saying much to me. Oh, Forgive us, God, when we discount the life you have given to us. And the work and the skills and the training and the preparation and the passion which led us into what we're doing. And remind us that that is ever much a mission field as any place in this world. For there are indeed people who need to know that God came for them. And that is this message. And Lord, that ought to bring great joy to our lives. For now we all have purpose. We all have meaning. We all have a mission. And it begins even this afternoon, but certainly tomorrow when we go to those places of employment, to those places of work, those places of responsibility. Help us to do it. To do everything as if indeed we are doing it for you. 
that it's the good news today. We give you thanks and pray that you will speak to us in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. We invite you today to respond to this.